Uh, so today uh, is Good Friday. This is the day on which we remember uh, that Jesus uh, was tried and tortured and crucified uh, for the world. Uh, so to remember this, especially on this day of Good Friday, we go through a special series of prayers, a series of worship called uh, the Stations of the Cross. And each station is a different moment, a different event that happens uh, in the process of Jesus' passion, as we call it. This is his passion, his time of suffering. And at each station, we, we take a moment to reflect on it, to read, to behold it, and to pray, and to think about how this deepens our relationship with Christ, and how in Christ's suffering, we see the suffering of others in our world, in our own day, and in our own time. So it's both reaching back through history to Christ, who went through this for us, and it's also reaching out in our own time to those who are suffering uh, innocently now. In many churches, this happens at stations that are part, uh, posted on the wall, where there are pictures or sculptures that depict each of these 14 sacred moments. But here, with the gathered Episcopal Church of Worcester and many of our other friends from other churches and other traditions, both clergy and lay and people who have never been in church before, we walk throughout Worcester and we pick symbolic places at which we stop and we remember the Stations of the Cross and we bring together, we bring together that memory of Jesus' suffering with those who are suffering in our own day, in our own time, right here in our very city. And we pray together on the sidewalk. Because as, as Meredith Ward, the leader of Walking Together, who is our urban missioner, just reminded us, this place is an altar as well. And God is present here on the street in our city, right here, just as much as in any church that you might go into. So God bless you and God bless yours as we come together in these holy days of walking with Christ. Unless you have other ideas. Uh, okay. No, no, I don't have any ideas. Okay, because I just grabbed a, a reader for the first station. Okay. And then we'll, we'll go from there. We're here today to take Jesus into the streets where he has always been and where he always belongs. Our task is to see holiness, to see God present.
Jesus is condemned to death here at the bus terminal, which as I was thinking about it, is so at odds with a place where you would think that that would normally happen because I suspect that were Jesus here in flesh and blood other than us, <laughs> that he would use this as a prime example for one of his stories or parables teaching about humanity. The winner of the Newbery Award for Children's Literature this past time is a book about a little boy who learns an awful lot at a bus terminal and on a bus later in the book. He has a conversation with someone who is blind. He has a conversation with people who are experiencing many different parts of life and learns an awful lot about the wonder and the difference of people and what a strength and what a joy that can be because these people are most unlike him. And in a place like this, that is the convergence of so much humanity, people who are going to places because they don't have money to get there any other way, people who are sitting for a while because they need a place to rest, people who are going to various places in the city because they're trying to be friendly to the environment. Whatever the reason, we learn so much just by watching and just by engaging. When I lived in New York, and moved to New Jersey because God has a sense of humor. Because I always use New Jersey people to talk about how Manhattan was a vision of the kingdom of heaven. Because you're thrust into relationships without your choosing. And the same thing happens in a place like this. Jesus talked so much about that in his life. And it was those very things that made people so uncomfortable and so nervous. And so for me, those two things, being in this place and thinking about it, has been a powerful experience. I hope that it's a powerful experience for you too as we continue on this journey together.
have Worcester Fellowship way up behind City Hall on the pavement. And in the summer, it's blazing, blazing hot. And in the winter, it's freezing, freezing cold. Spring, it's OK. Fall, OK. There's a lot of uh, people that come here. Um, as you know, in Worcester, we have a big drug opioid problem. A lot of people are here um, either recovering or, or actively using. And the, there are tables and chairs, which are very nice, except the chairs are chained to the tables. So none of us here can sit down. So when we have Worcester Fellowship, it's all standing. And uh, you try and pull out a chair and it's chained to the table, which isn't quite comfortable. coming in from the country just to see what was going on. He was going to be a spectator, a bystander for this event. And he was called into service. Again, I like that too. Because there are times in my life when I feel like a bystander and I just want to observe. I don't want to get involved. I just want to see what's going on. But then I get called into service. And I feel better for having done it. As we go in our lives, once in a while, we get called into service and our first reaction is, oh no, please, I don't want to. I don't have time. I've got to do something. I've got an errand. I've got brunch. I've got all sorts of things. But our call is to not to follow our plan, but to be of service to God in God's world the way that Jesus falls and the way that we've heard about Jesus falling once and the way we'll hear about him falling again. When Jesus falls in the very different ways in which Jesus falls, we are called to help, to help carry that cross. Sometimes we are called to help and sometimes we are actually called to be helped. Sometimes when we are doing the work of God in the world, we need help and we can't always do it by ourselves. If we think we have to do it by ourselves, we may give up. But when we call out for help, others can join that call as well. Simon, help. sometimes we are Simon, and sometimes we're helped by Simon. In either way, it's doing God's work and going to where we need to go. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, whose blessed Son came not to be served, but to serve, bless all who, following in his steps, give themselves to the service of others, that with wisdom, patience, and courage, they may minister in his name to the suffering, the friendless, and the needy. For the love of him who laid down his for us, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. The ninth station, Jesus falls the third time. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. He has besieged me 
and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of a long, long ago. Though I called and cried for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. Remember, O oh Lord, my affliction and bitterness and wormwood and the gall. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and, and like, like a sheep that, that before its shearers is you, so he opened not his mouth. The story has it that Jesus fell three times. My guess is he fell many more times than that. Remember where we are in the story. The night before he was in the garden, he was arrested. Then he was whipped, he was tortured, he was put in prison set up in a mock trial, had no food, no water. The next morning, he's expected to carry this heavy wooden implement that would become a cross upon which he would be crucified. He was exhausted. He was exhausted, he was hurt. He felt at some, men, uh, some measure an abandonment. An abandonment, and then also remember, at that time, on Fridays, was the day when they crucified people in Jerusalem. The journey would be filled with people on either side, cursing, spitting, throwing things. All that, all that violent, verbal oppression that he received. We have had somewhat different journey this morning, although the wind has been a bit of a challenge, and we have been moved graciously, I think, a couple of times. But contrast that with the journey of 2,000 years ago. We stand here at the Y. The Y was founded in London in 1844 at a time when people were, being, were coming into the cities because farming no longer sustained their livelihood. And people were coming into the cities and they had no place to live and they had no orientation and they were falling down right and left. And the Young Men Christians Association was formed to help offer people help, su support, succor, and strength. That movement started in England and came here. And since then, Ys have been all over the country, YMCAs, YWCAs, trying to pull people together, lift them up as they are beaten down by the challenges of life. About 20 years ago or so, when I was a priest here in the city of Worcester, before I went south to do another form of ministry. A group of us clergy met with the leaders of the Y, and we said there's a homeless problem in, in Worcester. And together we formed the Interfaith Hospitality Network. That began out of the commitment of the Y, which traced back over 100 years, to pick people up. I'm not sure of the relationship of the Y to the IHN these days, but that's where it began. And here is a place, an institution, this place on Main Street that Ys all across the country, indeed all over the world, are here to lift people up who fall down. Who fall down because they're exhausted, because they're beaten, because they're, they're denied access, because of their color, their race, their religion, or whatever. People are being displaced now, today, in a different way than perhaps a hundred years ago. And it's a challenge for us as religious leaders to do what we can to bind them up. People are being separated, siphoned off into silos. We as religious people following the journey of Christ need to carry the cross and bind us together into a human family. May it be so. Oh, yeah.
al lugar que se llamaba Gólgota, que significa lugar de la calavera, es, ofre, le, le ofrecieron a beber vino mezclado con... mezclado con... con gil. Pero él luego de um, haberlo probado, no quiso beberlo y se repitió y, repiti, y y repartieron sus vestidos entre sí, echándolo, echando a su suerte. Eso fue para que se cumpliera la escritura que decía, repartieron entre mis vestidos y sobre mi ropa echaron fuertes, suertes. They gave me gall to eat, and when I was thirsty, they gave me vinegar to drink. And at this station, uh, where Jesus was stripped, uh, part of it was he was stripped of his clothing, which was a way of shaming him, of mocking him, of again taking his dignity away, which was part of the whole process. And uh, it made me think about how unfortunately in society, we still do that to people who are different from us. You know, we strip them of their, of their dignity. And uh, a lot of these people are people who are less fortunate than us. And they know that feeling very well. But it made me also think that you know, dignity is one of the things that really it belongs to us. Our dignity is our self-worth. It's how we feel about ourselves. Other people can influence it, but it's ours. And a lot of times people will say, you know, that's the one thing we always have at our lowest point. But as Christians, we know that's not entirely true. We also have the love of God. And uh, I thought it was appropriate that, that we're in this place uh, for this station because this is the embodiment of the love of God. You know, he, uh, you come in here and you're loved regardless of where you are in life, regardless of the clothes and clothing you wear, regardless of everything. And you're also given your dignity, which is extremely important. And uh, I just thought that was important to bring up today. Thank you. housing. A person can get a room and a shared bathroom and kitchen for $750 a month. Think about that for a minute. By today's rental standards, that's very low, but for many people who are on disability, social security, other kinds of funding, it is more than they can afford. This is not the bottom, but for many people, it is a sign of the desperation that they feel in their lives. It could be a job loss, an illness, addiction one form or another, struggling to get sober, struggling to maintain their habit at a level that they can manage it. So many people are that way. This is a very fitting place to reflect when we come to the station in which Jesus is nailed to the cross. We need to be reminded time and again that Jesus was not crucified on a gold crucifix between two candlesticks on a linen-covered table. He was crucified between two thieves at the entrance to a city. In just a couple of weeks, I will be at that very spot that is believed that where he died. And it is now a site of pilgrimage for Christians throughout the world. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people visit there every year. 
But the day that Jesus was nailed to that cross, it was the entrance to the city. And the Romans, who were perhaps the most brilliant terrorists in history, which many unfortunate modern nations want to keep going, used it as a sign to folks coming into the city. That's where they crucified their criminals. It was their way of saying, we got a real nice town here and you all better behave. And Jesus was crucified between two criminals. God incarnate, the baby born in a manger, the man who fed 5,000 people, the one who healed the blind and the lame, was crucified between two criminals. The late writer A. Lee Wiesel, who for many years was at Boston University and was actually a colleague of mine, wrote a book that was the memoir of his being a child in a concentration camp in Poland where he saw his family die, his father die. He says that one day the Nazis decided to make an example of some of the camp and rounded up a group of men and they hanged to them and made everybody watch. It was their way of terrorizing those who were there. He said that most of the men died immediately, but there were a couple who twitched for over an hour. And one of the people in the crowd said, where is God? Where is he now? And Elie said he thought to himself, where is God? He is there hanging on those gallows with those people. So many of the places we visited today will never be seen on Chronicle. They're not going to be an article in the news magazine. And yet it's the reality of the world in which we live. It is so easy for us to forget unless we remember that the one we follow and worship as Lord did not die on a silver cross between two candlesticks on a linen-covered table. He died on a wooden cross between two thieves. Where is God? Right here with all of us.
You will not abandon me to the grave. And so we come to the end of Jesus' human life. We walk the journey with him in pain and sorrow.
And we pray that as by his death he has recalled us to life, so by his love he may raise us to eternal joys, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. To Christ our Lord who loves us and washed us in his own blood and made us a kingdom of priests to serve as God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The service is ended. The work begins. Many of us will scatter to other churches and communities now. There is a service at noon at All Saints if you feel a need to be there. But I thank all of you for being with us, for sharing this witness to faith in the midst of the city. And I pray that you all have all caught a glimpse of God's holiness among us. Amen. Amen. Amen.